Okay, so this is lecture number 26 in my series about creating an international sustainable civilization. Um, in the last one I talked about, the last few have been about, first of all, the centralization of wealth around the world, then the rise of authoritarian uh, leaders and the loss of democracy, which makes perfect sense that these things would happen. And then the next step is even internally within a society, businesses are commodifying human beings and they're um, exploiting their bodies, exploiting their emotions, exploiting their ability to uh, have self-control, to be reflective. Actually, the very thing that philosophy is, which is reflective consciousness, thinking about your thinking. So that was the, the aha moment in 800 BC in the Axial Age. So people started thinking about the fact that they're thinking about patterns, and then it sort of took off. They started thinking about all sorts of patterns and how to educate each other and how to live a good life. But um, this is about um, corporations using science and social science, thinking about how to make money and how to exploit uh, people for wealth. And I would say the main thing you do is kill that capacity to reflect. And I did have a friend do a PowerPoint. She showed the brain and it has the uh, corpus callosum is, is the sensory, your contact between you and the world is a part of the brain, deals with senses and then common sense. And Aristotle has this whole hierarchy, but there's the white matter that's connected to the brain stem that's deep inside the brain. And this is the part that is either not growing and there's, you know, there's brain scans to show the part is getting stunted or it's shrinking. And to me, that is, that's the physiological, physical picture of what happens when you kill philosophy, kill our natural desire to think about our thinking, to theorize, to try to find patterns. And so if that gets killed, or you'd, every possible distraction. Then when people finally do feel afraid enough or they get uh, really motivated by instant gratification or instant terror, they're going to come up with theories like QAnon that are ridiculous. And then the theoretical capacity will be denigrated again. Oh, that's just like old religion. That's just myth-making. That's primitive. But it was this use of the sciences, social sciences, technology, to undermine our ability to reflect. That's what led to this very primitive behavior. And then as an afterthought, you justify it with some theory. So it's because we want to find patterns. We want to find patterns because we actually can, but we, we want to find them even when we don't have much evidence to try to make sense out of the world, to try to ease our fears. And so now the theoretical capacity is not being educated because that was really serious. That's the whole education for wisdom is long-term, it's serious, it's a constant uh, give and take, examining and re-examining, practical wisdom, deliberating, um, stepping back, um, looking at the long-term, not letting yourself react, right? That's all, tragedies are all about when people overreact. So it's all about finding the mean between extremes, stepping back. And this is what is being destroyed. So 
this is what um, there are three books that I've read that have come out recently that emphasize how our psyche and our bodies are being exploited for gain. This is part of the whole international um, economic system. So colonialism and globalization that had led to huge concentration of wealth that had a profound effect on the overall culture of every nation in the world during this globalization process is the backdrop for these three books. So Gabor Mate in the in the book, The Myth of Normal, and he wrote some other books too related to the same theme. He's a doctor that treats physical illnesses that are caused by culturally induced stress. So his main argument is that we live in a toxic culture. Quote, chronic illness, mental and physical, is a function or a feature of our culture, not a glitch. If you are adapted to our culture, you will get chronic illness. Um, and this is where moral relativism has not been helpful at all. It's been another way that people have not been able, have ignored the fact about what the culture is doing to our physical bodies that's just plain old wrong and wicked. It's true for any culture, it's universally true. But anyway, if you have moral relativism, you don't make judgments. Well, you just get sick. He, um, so the last lecture, okay. So this lecture actually includes why our food system leads to chronic illnesses like diabetes and heart disease. And this lecture talks about mental illness and greed. So I've condensed those. And so I'll talk about diabetes and heart disease in a minute. Um, so much of what passes for normal in our society is neither healthy nor natural. To meet modern society's criteria for normality is in many ways to conform to requirements that are profoundly abnormal in relation to our nature given needs, which is to say unhealthy, harmful on the physiological, mental, and even spiritual needs. Illness is an expected and therefore a normal consequence of abnormal, unnatural circumstances. The United States skewed idea of normality is the single biggest impediment to fostering a healthier world. So just like the economic system, systems, mechanistic model and its obsession with growth is what's destroying um, the gap between the rich and the poor and the natural world was the key um, to a whole lot of other problems in the economic system. The, the idea of normality is the key to why we can't be healthier. So once again, the importance of an idea, ideas really matter. And if you've got the wrong idea, you're gonna be driven, you're gonna drive your society in a certain direction and you can be truly mistaken. And that's why those tragedies, the artwork in the Greeks, everybody has a reason. Everybody has an idea of what's good, what's just, what's practically wise. and Everybody except one character or one group um, is wrong. And so there's always one person who either is always the, the wise person or they change their mind. And by the end of the tragedy, they're wise, at least the tragedies that I've studied closely. There's always a way out. So Plato, Socrates is, is Plato's character that makes good judgment. Because, but there's many, many ways to go wrong. But it's hard to see that they're wrong and why they're wrong unless you can see the one that's right. Current The current medical paradigm reduces complex events simply to biology, to physical causes, and it separates mind from body. This is the reductionist model and the dualist model. Without appreciating their essential unity, 
Our health system actively ignores what science has already established, that living people cannot be dissected into separate organs and systems, not even into minds and bodies. So he's rejecting material reductionism and he's rejecting dualism. I went beyond the standard, he said, I went beyond the standard repertoire of dry doctorly questions about symptoms and medical history to ask my patients about the larger context for their illness, their lives, their health and illness arise from a web of circumstances, relationships, events, and experiences. And this very thing happened to me because I was going through a divorce and I would, I woke up one day and I just fell over. And so the ambulance came and the doctor asked, he had five issues, you know, it was um, sugar, sleep, um, alcohol, something, and, str and stress. And it was just, I really was suffering from what I would call divorce-itis, you know? <laughs> that was the physical illness had to do with this divorce and my sense of meaning and purpose and not knowing what was gonna happen next. So the myth of normal, the book begins with biology, then the relationships between our bodies, brains, and personalities, then the larger social, economic, and political contexts. Quote, we can return to what nature has always intended, to wholeness. Each of us contains possibilities for wellness. Healing is possible, but not guaranteed. So we have to, we have, we are destroying the environment within which we evolved. And so our bodies are naturally connected to nature, which again is, Aristotle and all the wisdom traditions, you stay in contact with the universe. All the rituals, all the meditation keeps that connection going. It was the modern world that cut it off. So now these doctors are trying, are realizing that and they're trying to tell us we need to get back to this. Um, so ancient traditions should be combined with modern medicine. That's his prescription, not just mine. Capitalism, and he does, goes back to capitalism, is far more than just an economic doctrine. It now encompasses an ethic, a set of teachings about how people should behave, educate their children, and even think. Its principal tenet is that economic growth is the supreme good, or at least a proxy for the supreme good, because justice, freedom, and even happiness all depend on economic growth. So it's interesting, he comes to the same conclusion that Capra and Luigi come to. Capitalism's influence today runs so deep and wide that its values, assumptions, and expectations potently infuse not only culture, politics, and law, but also such subsystems as the ac ac academy, education, science, news, sports, medicine, child rearing, and popular entertainment. The hegemony of materialistic culture is total. And this is where I've run into this in the academy. And this is where it's also gone global, which he would totally agree with. His solution is to go back basically to all the wisdom traditions, the traditions in Panchasila one, the five compassions. Science demonstrates positive effects of mindfulness, self-compassion and compassion, which are all virtues, Jesus, Socrates, Buddha, uh, you know, all the Muhammad, ordinary human compassion, being moved by the awareness of other people's suffering. It's not pity, it's empathy. Self-compassion is not feeling sorry for yourself. I hurt, but I will move on. Compassion of curiosity and understanding. Everything exists for a reason. The reason matters, always ask why. Again, this is Aristotle. Aristotle always asked why. Whenever he's dissecting plants and animals, why does this exist? What is its purpose? What is its meaning? And that's the Greek pantheon of gods. They all, all of them, their sacred passion has a purpose and a meaning because they all contribute to human flourishing. 
Um, but the modern world deliberately eliminated that question and, and changed it to how. How can I fix this? How can I change this? How does it work? How can I intervene? And Whitehead points this out. This is not any sort of new view. It's just that we perpetuate this old system that we don't, we know is not true. So the second book I'm bringing up is the one about the food system. Quote, in this book, I'm going to develop separate and parallel scientific, cultural, historical, economic, and social arguments that our minds have been hacked. This hack, this systematic confusion and conflation of the concepts and definitions of pleasure and happiness has been inserted into the limbic system, the emotional part of our brains, thereby precipitating a slow motion crash of a 25 to 50% of individuals and exacting a severe detrimental impact on our whole society. It was not accidental. It was specifically designed and engineered with a profit motive. It continues to be executed by private interests with government support. That's his book. He shows how corporations studied all this, figured out how to mess up our brain chemistry and get us, you know, to stimulate the emotional part so that the reflective part doesn't develop. It doesn't trigger. It's not capable of allowing us to sit back and live and examine life. So his position is as a practicing pediatric endocrinologist. So his patients are children with obesity and diabetes. Children never used to have those diseases. They're completely constructed by our food system. This imbalance in the limbic system hacks our decision-making capacity, which is philosophy, living an examined life. People with obesity and diabetes are addicted. They don't change their habits. They need to connect. We need to connect the biochemistry, neuroscience, genetics, physiology, medicine, nutrition, psychology and psychiatry, public health, economics, philosophy, theology, history, and law. All of these are interconnected. That's why you have to have a paradigm shift. You have to move to systems thinking and you have to move to sustainability. You have to move to eating natural foods and eating less and eating in a natural way and eating in a way that's sustainable. Sugar changes our biochemistry. We have a metabolic syndrome, it's called. It's a disease. Um, we have to link nutrition and physical health with behavioral health. Um, I read recently that every American, 80% of Americans over age 50 have a metabolic syndrome. Now, the foundational distinction for this whole book is from Aristotle, the difference between pleasure and happiness, virtue as the mean between extremes. Pretty amazing. I didn't pay this guy to write this book. Pleasure is the reward pathway in the brain versus happiness, contentment. These are completely separate pathways, completely different regulation. Reward is short-lived. Contentment is longer. You achieve a goal. Reward is visceral. Your body's fight or flight system versus contentment is calming. This sounds like Aristotle's mean between extremes, right? Wise person or Confucius or Buddha or Muhammad, right? They're not impulsive. They're not driven by reward. Reward is the result of substances like heroin, nicotine, cocaine, caffeine, alcohol, sugar. Contentment looks for achievements. Reward is taking and winning versus contentment is giving. I have so many students who are athletes and when they read this, I they realized their whole lives are based on a reward system. The things they eat, their relationships, sports, uh, school, you know, that you get rewarded with an A. It's just another kind of reward. It's not really 
that's what they live for. And then, so the book gives them or the reading gives them a chance to think about that. When unchecked, reward leads to misery. Whereas contentment, you walking in the woods, playing with grandchildren, you avoid becoming miserable at all. And that Aristotle says that learning how to feel pleasure and pain correctly is what habitual, the education and habits, the number one thing is learning how to feel pleasure and pain correctly, which is being able to step back and hit the mean between extremes, able to deliberate, which means you step back, you figure out the options, which one's best and why. Reward is driven by dopamine, contentment by serotonin. So they're totally different brain processes. So when you come to college, <laughs> What we really are supposed to do in philosophy class is change the way your brain works. Reward leads to diabetes and heart disease, cancer and dementia. So he even points this out, the ancient traditions, religion has been the arbiter of pleasure and happiness since religion began. It's one of the main functions of religion, all the rituals, all the, the belief, the monism, just monism. And then in relation to monism, you seek happiness rather than pleasure. Aristotle's happiness, being an ethical person, living on the basis of reason and virtue. This is what Mr. The author says. I didn't say this. He said this. Human flourishing, growth, physical and spiritual. It's not prone to acute changes. It's not related to circumstances. It's living an examined life. Christianity focused on happiness after death and pleasure is the devil and pain, a pleasure uh, on earth and pain and humility and service is the way to a happy afterlife. Now, the thing I like about Aristotle is he just says being generous and all that isn't painful in this world. It's pleasurable in this world. So you don't have to only rein in your pleasures so that you can go to heaven. You actually get pleasure from the things uh, from from virtue on in this world. Since the Renaissance, happiness has been the goal of life, and he calls it humanism. That's why you have to distinguish between Aristotelian humanism and this kind of modern secular uh, pleasure based, dopamine based kind of humanism. Positive psychology. This is. In the previous lecture, I talked about a positive psychologist. Utilitarianism was you're supposed to treat people like herd animals, pleasure and pain, and set up this system where you would um, have a system of pleasures and pain so that people would behave. That was straight out of Bentham. He corrupted Aristotle, and that's true. I used to teach all of that. We are naturally driven by pleasure and pain. And, and today that just mean, and means anything that triggers dopamine or an opioid release. So yeah, opioids are based on this pleasure. They, the neuroscientists learned how the brain works and they've gotten really good at uh, getting the hacking the brain. Today's most successful marketing strategies, uh, the corporate consumption complex is using neuroscience to manipulate people, to trigger dopamine, to define their happiness as pleasure only. The six biggest industries are all based on pleasure. Tobacco, alcohol, food, behavioral triggers, guns, cars, um, and, and energy, our energy system. There, there's constant improvement in new techniques in marketing based on neuroscience, the corporations have a stranglehold on our brains. They know the research. They do what works to control our body chemistry and our brain pathways. So that's pretty scary. Um, John Locke, his, his political philosophy, second treatise on government, he wanted Europeans to colonize the world, to take natural resources and make them into marketable products and sell them back. This was the way to press... Uh, prosperity and a higher standard of living. He had a mechanistic model for the economy as the best way to structure our economic lives, a system where people work for wealth, 
They calculate how to flourish economically as individuals, and this will make them happy, and it will make everybody else happy. This was a philosophy, and it's still the major philosophy in the United States. The government should not regulate business because they will do it according to the donations of their political donors. Therefore, you have to let the, the economic system do it. Well, then the economic leaders turn out to make the politicians into, into their puppets. So you really need an independent political class to put a check on greed. Aristotle says greed is the worst vice and it destroys societies. You have to have laws that prevent the centralization of wealth. Aristotle warned us about this. John Locke just threw out Aristotle. He wanted to set up a new system. The long-term exposure. Okay, the other one is, um, is fear, cortisol. Cortisol is the fear chemical. Long-term exposure to cortisol will kill you, but slowly, when pressures are relentless, your cortisol response can remain elevated for days, months, or years. Evidence of the associations between job stress, psychological distress, elevated cortisol, depression, and disease is extremely compelling. Chronic stress can speed the onset of dementia. So my son, I have, I have been... Uh, living on fear for a long time. And it's just this very slow. Um, I have to train myself not to have a panic reactions to things. My son ran a, an inner city school, very high stress job. He eventually got cancer because it's it's been proven scientifically that plastic leeches endocrine disruptors. Endocrine is one of our systems in our body. We wrap our food in plastic. It leeches these disruptors that get into our food. Most of us, because we're healthy, we resist it. My son, because of his stress, got neuroendocrine cancer. And I mean, this is, this. I, I'm just convinced that many of the cancers we have well, he is saying that. He's saying many of the cancers we have are just caused by toxic culture. Obesity ruins our dopamine system and stress makes it worse because we eat, especially sugar, to relieve stress. Um, and then leptin extinguishes the dopamine signal in obese people. The neurons are immune to leptin. So, so the dopamine signal doesn't stop going off. It's terrible, and it is body chemistry. So the only way to avoid it is to actually read and to become aware and to change your way of experiencing life, what makes you happy, your bonding with other people. The USA has a toxic culture. The lifespan is 26 out of 38 developing nations, and it's going down. We have the highest cost of health care. The deaths of white Americans, suicide, overdoses of prescription and street opioids, the liver disease from drinking, high, even though we have the highest income on earth. Prosperity index, 11 of 14 nations, even though we have the GDP, because our distribution of wealth is extremely unbalanced. In the World Happiness Report, we're 17th, even though we're the wealthiest country, and on the Happy Planet Index, which measures also sustainability, we're 105 out of 111, which is just awful. We're at war against nature. Our culture is at war against nature. Not only that, we're exporting this culture and we're forcing the Global South nations to sell our products and create it's a, create, it's a toxic uh, culture for them. Both of these authors explain why we have to return to the model of character development and character strength in the ancient wisdom traditions. They use modern science and social science. We can use it to create a flourishing uh, culture. We're now using science to exploit the earth, destroy the global ecosphere from which we evolved. We're using social science and neuroscience 
to corrupt our desires, our body chemistry, and also leading to a faster depletion of natural resources. We need a global rejection of this corrupt system. The kinds of people we need to call out the corruption and change, change it are people who are exercising all of Aristotle's virtues. The authors themselves recognize that Aristotle's model of flourishing is not only relevant, but critical for saving life on earth, for promoting flourishing societies, for saving democracies and avoiding authoritarian takeovers by leaders who will only centralize wealth and power even more. And, and we need Aristotle for creating a global civilization. The next series of lectures explains why the leaders of all the traditions in Ponchicilla I and the humanism of Ponchicilla II exercised all of Aristotle's virtues. So, so I hope you can see how everything's connected to everything and how we need this paradigm shift from the modern mechanistic reductionist models of culture to the systems view, which integrates the ancient views, I emphasize Aristotle, add science and social science in order to get us to a truly sustainable culture in a time when we really need a lot of technology, a lot of engineering to undo what we've done to avoid moving in the direction that we have been moving in for hunt for, for centuries. <laughs>